So let's transition now to cervical cancer. Uh, cervical cancer obviously is the most common uh, malignancy worldwide. We're fortunate in the Western and industrialized world uh, uh, to have screening and vaccination, but the incidence has not fallen. It's surprisingly very stable. Um, and so we continue to be very passionate. All of you on this panel are very passionate about treating cervical cancer. Uh, last year, the staging was changed. Chris, tell me why this, why and how the staging for cervical yeah. cancer was changed. You know, and just to you know, riff on what you said about ovary, 2018 was a really interesting year for cervical cancer also. Not only in the screening and prevention um, area where we have new data showing that HPV DNA testing may make pap smears obsolete, but we also had a two-dose um, vaccination program approved by the FDA. And then as far as staging goes... And, and, and additional data just came out showing one dose may, uh, may almost... Right. That's exactly too. right. In the young population. In the young yeah. patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as far as the staging goes, for a long time, patients with early stage disease the and locally advanced disease, the status of the lymph nodes has a very important prognostic aspect in determining who suffers from early death and recurrence. And so in the 2018 revision, lymph node status has finally been incorporated into the staging and it can be um, lymph node status based on pathology or radiology. Second thing is the 1B2 classification of tumors and 1B1, it was before it was a tumor diameter under four centimeters versus larger than four centimeters. Now that category has been split into three groups, two centimeters, two to four centimeters, and then beyond four centimeters. And I think this is gonna give more granularity to allow um, oncologists treating these patients to really be able to tailor the therapeutic challenge in the early stage patients. And patients with lesions larger than four centimeters, they all need to be treated with chemo radiation. I think it's very that. clear. So let's talk about that. If they all need to be treated with chemotherapy and radiation, maybe there's an opportunity for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in those 1B2, now 1B3 lesions over four centimeters. Um, uh, so the idea would be to give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy, make it a small cancer, and then do a radical hysterectomy. So there's a, an abstract here presented uh, that showed that neoadjuvant chemotherapy did not improve outcomes. So to your point, today still, greater than four centimeters should get chemotherapy and radiation. Okay. So I'm, I'm very honored here to be with uh, Jubilee Brown from North Carolina. Uh, she is uh, uh, president now or come to be? Vice president. Vice yes. president, president-elect of the AAGL, the American Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopists. Thank you. Most or many, much of our surgery is minimally invasive. So we'd had a trial that showed that minimally invasive surgery, that is minimally invasive radical hysterectomy, removal of the paracervical soft tissue upper vagina and lymph nodes, radical hysterectomy, should not be performed with this minimally invasive technique and you're the chair of the society. <laughs> Maybe you should come back to our society. I know you're already part of our society. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So what's the answer? Has your practice changed with this LAC trial, which showed in a randomized fashion that minimally invasive radical hysterectomy cervical cancer patients do worse? Nothing like putting me on the spot, Brad. That's what we're so, doing. <laughs> this I is think, a deposition, by the that's way. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's interesting. It certainly has changed counseling. Um, okay. I think that, okay. you know, this, this is, it is true. It's the best trial that we have in this mm -hmm. space. Uh, this was a randomized, prospective, international trial. New England Journal. New England Journal of Medicine published um, that, that randomized patients with early cervix cancer into minimally invasive, um, granted mostly straight sticks laparoscopy, not robotic, uh, versus open abdominal radical hysterectomy. Um, and did show at four-year disease-free survival was worse, and overall survival worse in the... Um, in the minimally invasive cohort. I will say there were, however, some substantial flaws in that study, um, and those have been detailed elsewhere, but really from statistical standpoint uh, to, to uh, pathology, uh, to uh, full data being available, um, it, it leads to some questions on can we generalize this to all of our patients? I think, however, it is, um, it, it is important to move forward with this and to hopefully answer that question. Now, the staging that Krish outlined may be helpful, 
Um, and you know, it may be that we can use minimally invasive surgery for the new uh, 1B2, so basically uh, up to four centimeters, or maybe just 1B1, less than two centimeters. And I think further studies will look at that. But um, I have to make decisions now. Well, so, so now what do we, I, tell, I get it and I counsel the patient, but my patients generally say, look, Monk, tell me what to do and then I'll weigh it. So I have to make a recommendation to my patient. What's the recommendation yeah. for cervical cancer that's that big? It's a matter of a lot of debate. My personal opinion, based on looking at all of these data and also looking at our own single institution data, is that I counsel the patient appropriately, I share with them all of the lack information, and I think that minimally invasive surgery is still appropriate for those small cancers. What do you think, Chris? I completely agree with her. I, you know, the couple points that I want to make about that trial, though, is they didn't folk, the study wasn't focused on robotics, but the fallout has all been on robotics. There was also an FDA alert about not performing robotic surgery for cervical cancers and breast cancers. And I think there's a disconnect because I would submit and agree that doing a radical hysterectomy with a laparoscope is probably challenging for many of us, including myself. But robotics is different and it almost approximates an open operation. And so I agree with Jubilee, it needs to be studied further, but I think lesions under two centimeters, I think minimally invasive surgery is appropriate. Tom, you're a surgeon, what do you think, brother? Well, I, I, I'll take the dissenting view here. I'm, I'm not one to ignore phase three New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper and I, I, evidence. And, and there was also a, a companion piece that was published that showed almost the same effect looking at the SEER database. And I'm not a huge oh, fan of that. a database study. I understand I'm not a big study. fan of that. But when it shows exactly the same thing, and a phase three prospective study showed, uh, it at least is validating that data that there wasn't something so unique about that population when you look at a U.S. population and it showed the same thing uh, with robots. So um, at this point, uh, I'm counseling the patients and most of them are opting to be open. But so they, go, they go home in two days. You know, young patients, they're healthy. They go home in a couple days after an open procedure. I did an open radical last week. She went home the next day. Yeah. I, I was exactly on call. Right. I wasn't that happy about it, but my partner yeah. says, what is she? She's right. Set, set yeah. her home. They, they, they usually I, go home in two days. But I think we have to be careful about it, really how we counsel our patients. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we give the best know. treatment they to patients. Know. And so we need to make sure we don't espouse a trial that has type 1 error. Right. Maybe it and, does. And yes, counsel. So. I'm, I'm not advocating against counseling. But I think we owe them a, 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 a guide, a roadmap, and whether they choose to take it or not, it's their choice, right? So I, I'm going to take a more moderate approach. So I think a, 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 a minimally invasive radical for a, you know, a substantial cancer, which could even be one to two centimeters, probably should be open. But for a you know, small tumor that you can barely see, it probably doesn't matter. And that patient, quite frankly, doesn't, doesn't probably, need a radical. Doesn't need a radical probably anyways. cured with a cone or a simple yeah. that, So that's mm -hmm. the point, right? Mm -hmm. So if, yeah. if, you, if you need a real radical, yeah. probably, probably make an incision. And if you don't need a real radical, then laparoscopy. Uh, I think we need to study it further. I don't think we're there Well, we do. I agree. I'm happy to study <laughs> monk, it further. But in the face of that, you can't. That's a, yeah, I know. First time you I see it. You can't ignore phase three days. I agree. 